The Sixth Night. Unkei was an influential Japanese Buddhist sculptor who died in 1223, but the modern narrator of the Sixth Dream nevertheless finds him at work at Gokokuji, a temple in Tokyo that was not established until 1681. Hearing that the sculptor Unkei was carving the two benevolent kings at the main gate of the Gokokuji, I decided to stroll over and take a look. I arrived to find a large crowd already gathered and vigorously exchanging opinions on the word in progress. A large red pine stood about seven or eight yards in front of the gate, trunks stretching towards the distant blue sky at just the right angle to obscure the gate's tiled roof. The pine's green foliage and the red lacquered gate contrasted beautifully with each other. The pine was well positioned too. Rising unobtrusively from the left of the gate, growing broader as it slanted up and across to reach the roof, it had an antiquated air, even putting me in the mind in mind of the Kamakura era. But the people watching were all of the Meiji era, just as I was. In fact, the larger part of the crowd was rickshaw drivers. No doubt they had grown bored of simply standing around waiting for passengers. Talk about big. Must be a lot more work than carving a person. As I considered this, another man spoke. Huh, it's the benevolent kings. They're still carving the benevolent kings? You don't say. I thought that all the benevolent kings were as old as the hills. They do look strong, eh? As different men said to me. You know what they say, right? There's never been anyone stronger than the two benevolent kings. They say they were even stronger than Yamato Dake no Mikoto. This man had his kimono tucked up around his waist and wore no hat. He looked decidedly uneducated. Unkei kept his hammer and chisel in motion, utterly ignoring the commentary from his audience. He did not even glance behind him. Perched high above, he stayed hard at work carving out the faces of the benevolent kings. Balanced on Unkei's head was something like a small eboshi. I couldn't tell what his clothes were made of. Perhaps rough, unlined suo. But his loose sleeves were tied back to keep them out of the way. The effect was quite archaic. It made for a dra jarring contrast with his chattering audience. Why, I wondered, was Unkei still alive in the present day? It was a mystery to me, but I did not stop watching. Unke, for his part, remained focused solely on his carving, apparently not finding the situation mysterious or odd in the slightest. A young man who had been gazing up at all this turned to me. That's Unke for you, he said, enwrapped. We're not even here for him. It's as if he's saying the only heroes under heaven are the benevolent kings they are. Just remarkable. Intrigued by what the man had said, I glanced towards him. Just look at how he uses that hammer and chisel, he continued, without even pausing. He's transcended this world entirely. He's entered the realm of supreme freedom. Unke was now carving out a bushy pair of eyebrows, about an inch high. No sooner would he bring the blade of his, his chisel back up then his hammer would come down at an angle to strike it again. A stubby chip fell as each blow rang out, and as I watched an enraged nose emerged from the hard wood, nostrils flared. 
Unkei showed no hesitation as he wielded the blade. He did not appear to be troubled by even the smallest of doubts. Amazing that he can just throw the chisel around like that and still get the eyebrows and noses to come out the way he wants. I said almost to myself as if too impressed to keep my thoughts aside. Inside. Oh, it doesn't, it isn't the chisel that makes those eyebrows and noses, the young man said. Those exact eyebrows and noses are buried in wood, and he just uses the hammer and chisel to dig them out. It's just like digging a rock out of the ground, there's no way to get it wrong. This was a new way to think about sculpture for me. If what the man said was true, I realized that anyone should be able to do it. Suddenly, wanting to try carving some benevolent kings of my own, I left the crowd to it and returned home. I pulled a chisel and a steel hammer from my toolbox and went out, went out into my backyard. An oak tree had fallen in a storm earlier, and I had chopped it into firewood, giving me a pile of pieces of wood of just the right size. I chose the largest piece and began to carve rigorously, but unfortunately I did not find the benevolent kings inside, nor sadly did I find them in the next piece I chose, nor the third. One by one I had carved up every piece of firewood in the pile, but the benevolent kings were nowhere to be found. Finally I realized that the benevolent kings were simply were not buried in Meiji trees. With this more or less understood, I knew understood why Wunke was still alive. The seventh dream has long been viewed as a metaphor for Japan in the Meiji era. Many at the time felt that the nation had lost its way in its attempts to modernize, yet had no way of influencing the direction in which things were moving. I found myself aboard a great ship. Day and night the ship cut its way through the waves, belching endless black smoke as it went. The noise was horrific, but where the ship was headed I didn't, I didn't know. All I saw was the sun, rising from the waves like a red-hot fire iron. It rose until it was directly over the tallest mast, and then seemed to simply hang there. But before long it had passed overhead and gone ahead of the great ship. Finally, hissing like a red-hot fire iron, it would sink beneath the waves again. The boat would let out its horrific noise and give chase, but it never caught up. Once I caught up, I caught hold of a crewman. Is this boat headed west? I asked him. The crewman looked at me for a moment, caution in his face. Why? he asked finally. Because we seem to be chasing the setting sun. The crewman guffawed and walked away, leaving me where I stood. Then I heard him singing a work song. The westering sun, does it east end in the east? Can this be the truth? The east risen sun, does it hail from the west? Can this too be true? Tossed on the waves, rudder for a pillow. Let it roll, let it roll. Heading to the bow, I saw many sailors gathered there to haul in the sal stout lines. I became terribly lonely. I did not know when I would ever stand on dry land again. Nor did I know where we were headed. The only certainties were the black smoke the ship belched and the way it cut through the waves. The waves themselves stretched on and on and a seemingly limitless field of blue. Sometimes they turned purple too. But around the ship they were always chur churned pure white with foam. I was terribly lonely. Better to throw myself overboard and die, I thought, than to remain on a ship like this. Many others were on board. Most appeared to be foreigners, but there were faces of all kinds. Once, as the ship swayed under a cloudy sky, 
A woman clung to the handrail, weeping piteously. The handkerchief she wiped her eyes with looked white, but she wore a western outfit made of something like chintz. I realized when I saw her that I was not alone in my sadness. I was gazing at the stars out on the top deck one evening, when a foreigner approached and asked if I knew any astronomy. I was so bored that I wanted to die. <laughs> astronomy meant nothing to me. Uh, I ignored him, but the foreigner then began to tell me about the seven stars that crowned Taurus. Taurus. Uh, the stars, he went on, the sea, all had been created by God. Finally, he asked if I believed in God. I ignored him, eyes turned to the sky. Once I entered the salon to see a splendidly dressed young woman facing away from me as she playing the piano. Beside her stood a tall, dashing man, singing alone. His mouth seemed terribly large. But the two of them appeared entirely without interest in anything outside each other. They even seemed to have forgotten that they were on a ship. My boredom grew desperate. At last I resolved to die. So one evening, when no one was around, I gathered my courage and leapt overboard. Except at the moment, my feet left the deck and my link with the ship was severed. I longed to live. I regretted what I had done from the bottom of my heart. But it was too late. I was headed into the sea whether I liked it or not. The ship, however, had apparently been built extraordinarily tall, and so although I, my body was clear of it, my feet had yet to reach the water. With nothing to catch hold of, though, I drew closer and closer to the sea. I pulled in my legs as much as I could, but still I drew closer. The water was black in color. Meanwhile, the ship had moved on, belching the same black smoke as always. I understood for the first time that I would have been better off on board, even if I did not know where I was headed. But I could make no use of that knowledge now, and felt infinite fear and regret as I quickly, quietly fell towards the black waves. The eighth dream is one of the most cryptic and intricate of the series. Dwelling on sight and perspective. Notably, the narrator appears able to see into other dreams through the windows and mirrors of this one, raising new questions about how the ten dreams might be interrelated. Crossing the threshold of the barber shop, I was greeted by a chorus of Irashai from several men in white who had been waiting inside. I stood in the middle of the square room and looked around. Two of the walls had windows, and mirrors hung on the other two. By my camp, there were six mirrors in all. I approached one of the mirrors and seated myself before it. A well-stuffed cushion greeted my behind. This was a very comfortably made chair. The mirror reflected my face splendidly. Behind my face I could see a window. I could also see the low wooden slat screen around the raised corner of the room where accounts were kept. There was no one at the low accounting desk behind the screen. The people in the street outside were visible from the waist up as they passed the windows. Shotaro passed by accompanied by a woman. He was wearing a Panama hat that he must have bought since I saw him last. And the woman too. When had he made her acquaintance? It was quite beyond me. He seemed most pleased with both of his new finds. As I tried to get a proper look at the woman's face, they passed out of sight. A tofu peddler blowing a trumpet went past. His cheeks swelled as if stung by bees as he held the trumpet to his mouth. They were still swollen as he passed out of sight, which weighed heavily on my mind. It made me feel as if he would stay bee stung for the rest of his life. 
A geisha appeared. Her face was not yet powdered white. Her Shimada hairstyle sagged at the base and looked sloppily done overall. Her face still looked half asleep. Her color was so poor that I felt sorry for her almost. She bowed and greeted someone, but whoever it was did not appear in the mirror. Just then, a large man in white approached me from behind, scissors and comb in hand, and began examining my hair. Twisting my thin whiskers, I asked him what he thought. Could he do anything with it? Without saying a word, the man in white tapped me gently on the head with the amber comb he held in his hand. Yes, my hair too. What do you think? Can you do anything with it? I asked the man in white. He did not reply, but began sweeping away with his scissors. I watched closely in the mirror, keeping my eyes wide open so as not to miss anything. But with each snip of the scissors, a lock of black hair flew towards me, and eventually I lost my nerve and closed my eyes again. Upon which the man in white spoke. Did sir see the goldfish peddler outside? I did not, I replied. The man in white snipped on, saying nothing more. Just then, someone suddenly cried, Look out! My eyes flew open and I saw the wheel of a bicycle framed by the man in the white, my white's arm. I saw a rickshaw's pole, but then the man in white placed both hands on my head and turned it firmly to the side. I could no longer see the bicycle or the rickshaw at all. The scissors snipped away. Eventually, the man in white stopped, stepped around to my side and began trimming around my ears. Now that locks of hair had stopped flying around, I could open my eyes without fear. Awa mochi here. Mochi mochi, someone called from quite near. They were keeping time by pounding the mochi in a small mortar and pestle as they chanted. I had not seen an awamochi peddler since I was a child, and I wished I could see this one, but they never appeared in the mirror. The sound of mochi being pounded was the closest I got. I peered into the corner of the mirror, straining my vision to the limit. Suddenly I realized that there was now a woman kneeling behind the slat screen. She was dark of complexion, with thick eyebrows and a heavy beard, had her hair up in an Icho Gaishi hairstyle, and wore a plain suawase over a black juban. She was counting a stack of bills. They looked like 10 yen bills to me. She lowered her long eyelashes and pursed her thin lips, focusing intently and counting at a remarkable speed. Nevertheless, there seemed to be no end to the bills. There couldn't have been more than a hundred or so in her lap. But those hundred bills remained a hundred bills, no matter how long she came. I stared absently at the woman's face and the ten yen bills. Then, in a loud voice right by my ear, the man in white said, Let's get you shampooed. This was just the chance I needed. So as soon as I rose from the chair, I looked back over towards the counter. But behind the counter, I could not see neither the woman, nor the bills, nor anything else. Paying my bill and leaving the barber shop, I saw five small oval tubs lined up in the street to the left of the doorway. The tubs were full of goldfish, red goldfish, spotted goldfish, skinny goldfish, fat goldfish and many other kinds. The goldfish peddler sat behind them. Chin in hand, he sat gazing at the goldfish lined up before him, completely motionless. The bustle and movement at all, all around did not seem to bother him at all. I stood there for 
while watching him, but I did not see him move once the entire time. As with the second dream, many scholars see echoes of Soseki's uh, own childhood in this story, The Ninth Night. That the violent internal struggles of Japan's Meiji Restoration began one year after Soseki himself was born is suggestive. There were rumblings of unrest abroad. War seemed ready to break out at any time. Unsaddled horses fleeing, burned-out stables, seemed to gallop around the house day and night, chased by unruly guardsmen. Within the house, however, all was quiet and still. In the house were a young mother and her child. Almost in his third year, the child's father had left for parts unknown. He had set out on a night with no moon. He had pulled his straw waraji onto his feet, donned a black hood, and gone out the side door. The mother had been holding a bonbori lantern, from which the light fell long and thin into the dark night, illuminating the old cypress by the edge. The child's father never came back. Every day the mother would ask her child, Where's daddy? The child did not say anything. Eventually, he began to reply, away. When the mother asked when will he be home, the child would smile and say, away again. This would make the mother smile too. Then she would repeat to the child over and over, he will be home soon. The child, though, only learned to say, soon. Sometimes he would reply, soon, when she asked him, where's daddy, too. Once night had fallen and had grown quiet outside, the mother would retie her obi around her waist, slipping into it a short sword in a shark's skin scabbard, tie the child to her back with another narrower obi, and then duck out through the side gate. She always wore zori on her feet. The sound of these zori was sometimes enough to lull the child to sleep. The mother would walk west, leaving the earthen walls of the houses behind until she reached the bottom of the hill where the great ginkgo tree stood. Cutting right at the ginkgo tree, she would continue another hundred yards or so until she saw the torii. Off to the right, at the end of a path with a rice paddy on one side and nothing but bamboo scrub on the other. Beyond the torii was a dark stand of cedar trees. After that, she would walk another forty stone paved yards before arriving at the foot of the stairs leading up to the old shrine. Above the offering box, which had been washed a dull grey, a rope hung from a large bell, and in the daytime a framed sign could be seen hanging out in beside the bell which read Hachimangu. The first character on the sign was drawn in an interesting way like two pigeons facing each other. Many other framed offerings hung there too. Most were gold-papered kinteki, accompanied by the reins of the warriors that had shot an arrow through them. Here and there a sword had been offered up as well. Past the Hortori, there were always owls hooting in the branches of the cedars. The mother's rough zori slapped wetly on the ground. Once they reached the temple and the sound stopped, the mother would first ring the bell, then immediately drop to a crouch and bring her hands together. The five owls usually fell silent at this point. The mother would then pray fiercely for the safety of her husband. Her husband, she reasoned, was a samurai. While Hachiman was god of the bow, surely prayers as fervent as hers would not go entirely unheard. The child would often wake at the sound of the bell 
and, scared by the surrounding darkness, burst into tears on the mother's back. At such times, the mother would not stop mumbling her prayers, but she would jog the child gently on her back, soothingly. Sometimes this was enough to stop the child from crying. Sometimes it just made things worse. By the way, the mother did not rise from her crouch lightly. Once she had made all the prayers for her husband's safety that she could, the mother would loosen the narrow obby around her back and bring the child around to her front, holding him in her arms as she climbed the stairs to the shrine proper. Be good now, she would say, rubbing her cheek close against his. I won't be long. Then she would slip the narrow obby off entirely, tie one end around the child and loop the other end through the railing on the shrine porch. This done, she would descend the staircase again to begin the task of treading back and forth across the forty pe- yards of paved stone one hundred times to seal her p- petition. Left tied to the temple, the child would crawl about its broad porch in the darkness as far as the obi would allow. Nights like this were a great relief to the mother. When the tied-up child cried and wept, on the other hand, she would be driven to distraction. The pace of her hundred repetitions across the courtyard would pick up dramatically. She would become terribly out of breath. Sometimes she had no option but to interrupt her pacing to climb the stairs to the shrine proper, soothe the child any way she could, and then begin her hundred repetitions again. The mother spent countless fretful nights this way, unable to sleep for worry over the child's father. But he was long since dead, slain by a masterless samurai. This sad tale I heard from my mother in a dream. The tenth night, the series finishes with the uneasy comedy of the tenth story which, read carefully, contains no intention, indication that it is a dream at all. Shotaro had come home in the evening. Seven days after, the woman took him away and immediately gone to bed with a fever, or so I heard from Ken, who had visited to give me the news. Shotaro was the best-looking man in the neighborhood, an impeccably honest and upright to the boot, He had just one vice. When evening fell, he would put on his Panama hat, seat himself outside the fruit shop, and gaze at the faces of the women passing by. He always found much to admire in them. Outside of this hobby, he had no particular quirks worth mentioning. When women were scarce, he would give up on the foot traffic and look at the fruit instead. All kinds of fruit were there. Peaches, apples, loquats, bananas, all neatly arranged in two rows of baskets. Ready for use as visiting gifts. Beautiful, Shotaro would murmur, gazing at the baskets. If I were to go into business, it would have to be a fruit shop. Not, of course, that he ever did anything but loaf around in his Panama hat. Such a pretty color, he might say, admiring, for example, some Natsumika. But he had never actually put down the money to buy any of the fruit. And, of course, none of the fruit could be eaten for free. Praising their color was as far as he went. One evening, a woman had suddenly appeared outside the store. She had appeared to be of some standing in society and had been splendidly dressed. Shotaro had been utterly entranced by the colors of her kimono. He had also found much to admire in her face. Doffing his panama hat, he had greeted her. 
cordially. She had responded by pointing at the large, largest basket of fruit and saying, That one, please. Shotaro had handed it over to her at once. The woman had held it in one hand for a moment before saying, My, how heavy it is. Unburdened by other ob obligations and solicitous by nature, Shotaro had volunteered to help the woman carry her fruit home and left the store with her. He had never come back. Shotaro had always been irresponsible, but this was too much even for him. After seven days, his family and friends had begun to fear the worst. And just as they were rising, raising the alarm, he had casually strolled home again. Everyone crowded around to ask where he had gone, and he told them a story of riding a train into the mountains. It must have been a remarkably long train ride. As Shotaro told the story, when the train stopped, he had disembarked to find himself in a meadow, so large that he had seen nothing but green grass in every direction. He had walked across the grass with the woman until suddenly they were at the edge of a cliff. Now the woman had said to him, jump. Peering over the edge, Shotaro had seen the face of the cliff, but could not see the ground below. Doffing his Panama hat again, he had made several polite demurrals. If you don't jump, the woman said, said, you'll be licked by a pig. Are you quite sure? There were two things Shotaro disliked: pigs and the raw kyoku singer, Kumoemon. He did not, however, despise either of them more than he valued his life, and so he had again refused to jump. At that moment, a pig had appeared, snuffling as it came. Seeing no other option, Shotaro had struck the pig across the snout with his beetlewood walking stick. The pig rolled over the edge of the cliff with an oink. Shotaro had barely breathed a sigh of relief before another pig had begun, nuzzling him with its large snout. Once more he had no option but to raise his walking stick. Once more the pig had oinked and tumbled upside down into the pit. And then yet another pig appeared. This was when Shotaro had happened to glance up and realize that a whole herd of pigs, a line of countless thousands stretching out to the edge of the grassy meadow, were noisily making their way directly to where he stood at the edge of the cliff. Terror had gripped his heart. Still, with no other options, all he could do was strike the pigs across the snout with his walking stick one by one as they arrived. Mysteriously, the pigs would roll over the edge of the cliff as soon as the stick touched their snouts. Peering over the precipice, Shotaro had seen a whole column of upside-down pigs falling down the cliff face into the apparently bottomless depths. The idea that he had sent so many pigs over the cliff had scared even him, but the pigs had been relentless. They had been like a dark cloud with legs oinking and inexhaustible as they trampled the fresh green grass. Shotaro had put up a heroic fight, beating pigs across the snout for six nights and seven days. Eventually, however, his energy dwindled, his hands became weak as cognac, and finally he had been licked by a pig. With that, he had collapsed at the edge of the cliff. So you see, too much girl watching can be bad for you, Ken said as he concluded this story. I had to agree, but Ken had also been ta talking about how he had wanted Shotaro's Panama hat. Shotaro was doomed. That Panama was as good as Ken's.